Good evening, everybody. I hope everybody can uh, hear me. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for participating. And those of you that have shared this uh, live video on Facebook, of course, I am joined by the one and only Mr. Dr. Konstantinos Farsalinos. How are you doing? Good, Doc. Hi, Dimitris. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I think we have some important information to share today with uh, your audience. Absolutely. I just want to make sure everybody can hear us uh, very well. Just give me a confirmation. I'm trying to keep eye on the chat on the side, but there's just a lot of stuff going on here. It looks like everybody can hear us. So before we get started, I do want to thank the almost uh, 70,000, 70,000, 70,000 participants in this survey, the largest ever survey done on flavors and the importance that they have in transitioning and maintaining themselves off combustible tobacco. Also, a huge shout out to Casa. They did a just, uh, just jump right off the bat and helped a lot with this, created a text number where people could uh, just text and really quickly participate in the survey. Uh, Fig Ramsey with Vape Tithing, he did a, a, just a fantastic job. Uh, the Vaping Legion guys, the YouTube reviewers, um, everybody on social media, on Instagram and on Twitter that helped and participate. Thank you so much. I wish I could say the same about our federal advocacy groups, but whatever. It is what it is. We still got 70,000 uh, participants, which is great, right, Dr. F? I mean, this is a this is a very significant number. Also, I want to thank Dr. Christopher Russell as well, too. I just want to make sure I don't leave, leave him out as well, too. Right, Dr. F? Yeah, it's uh, by far the largest survey in terms of sample size ever performed. Uh, we had... Uh, 69,233 unique IP addresses. So, and that was the only way that we could uh, exclude double entries. Now, that's not the best, an ideal solution because you may have in the same uh, house uh, two vapors living there and using the same Wi Fi connection. So, they will participate through the same IP address to the questioner. But there is no other way of uh, ensuring that we, we wouldn't have a double entry. So we um, only uh, used unique IP, so one participation per IP address, and uh, we had an outcome of uh, 69,233 participants whom uh, we consider unique participants based on the IP address. Now, the one question that I'm getting the most about the flavor study is, did we submit it into the FDA comment submission in time before the deadline? It was submitted in time. Uh, I do have uh, a tracking um, uh, file. Uh, with, uh, but however, but uh, unfortunately, the FDA has not released the, the comment, the, the PDA file yet uh, publicly. And um, I spoke with many people in the US. They tell me that there are many problems with the FDA and they delayed quite a lot. So I decided that uh, we should release uh, the data uh, publicly through your uh, show tonight, but also on my blog. In a few minutes, I'm going to upload on my blog a very short comment and the PDF file with all the data, the same file that I submitted to the FDA. Uh, so because uh, I also have requests from many people in the US who want to use um, the data in other activities, uh, activities in specific cities where they are um, thinking of implementing uh, flavor bans or some actions against the FDA. So instead of, you know, contacting each one separately and sharing the data, I thought I would um, share it publicly for everyone to have access, uh, to be able to cite and refer to this study uh, somewhere online. So your show is the first one. And um, in a few minutes, it's going to be available on my blog and everyone can uh, download uh, the whole PDF file. I think it's important to note that even our comment, the Tennessee Smoke Free Association, which was a very detailed comment with data from the uh, stores that are under our umbrella here, still has not been published as well, too. It's kind of ironic. All these really good data comments are not available yet, but I'm sure they will at some point. So I just want to reiterate that, especially now that we're going through this period of flavor bans in California, Minnesota, Chicago, New York, this study will be vital for you to use as a tool to combat that, whether it's a local city, state, 
um, proposal for, for flavor bans on electronic cigarettes, and it will be made available publicly on eCigaretteResearch.org, which you can download the PDF and then present it as evidence when you're going to the city councils or state, state buildings to talk to your legislators about flavors, correct? Yes, I think it's the strongest uh, data we can have on flavors. Unfortunately, there's nothing uh, more about it. I think there should have been more, but that's the best that we could do. Um, I, I still think that the cigarette um, industry is a bit disorganized uh, and uh, they are not acting as rapidly as they can. Um, to be honest, I was planning this survey for many months since since last year because I knew that something like that was coming. Uh, it was more than obvious and um, you don't need to be a prophet or to be very clever to understand where things are moving to. Uh, so um, uh, we knew that uh, eventually flavor would be under attack. Uh, you could see it uh, through the, the whole environment in the mass media, in uh, several city councils which have tried or even succeeded in implementing bans, for example, San Francisco. So um, it's, uh, it's really tough in the US. I think it's a big problem. There's a lot of emotional discussion. There's a lot of, um, quote, ethical aspects that are involved in uh, a prohibitionist approach. So you shouldn't use anything, um, which, uh, of course, fits to the cigarette perfectly for them, but doesn't fit anywhere else. Um, uh, there are many things in daily lives that we do that carry some risk and that we could avoid them. For example, I haven't heard anyone in the public health community suggesting that we should ban the use of our cars on weekends because we are exposed to a risk of an accident for no reason, for fun, for pleasure. Um, but the e-cigarette we should clarify and emphasize that the e-cigarette is not only a product used for pleasure, it's a product substituting the positive effects from smoking. And that's the most important thing. It helps people quit smoking. It's not just another consumer product that may carry some risk and we think we should, you know, ban it. Uh, for uh, There are reasons why they shouldn't be banned. There are There is a specific role. It's not like smoking. You know, the tobacco cigarette is not substituting anything harmful. It is harmful by itself. Uh, all the restrictions are fully justified but um, for tobacco cigarettes, but for the e-cigarette, which is not, you know, it's, it's an alternative with the goal of substituting for smoking. So we should always consider that, and we should make not only risk proportionate uh, regulation, but also regulation that addresses the role of the e-cigarette as a smoking substitute. That's extremely important. I've never seen anyone um, marketing or promoting these cigarettes as a, a less harmful uh, product than smoking for a non-smoker to use. It's always promoted and it should be promoted as a less harmful product for a smoker to use. So, um, of course, you're, you're never going to have zero use by unintended populations. Usually I call them unintended populations and I mean non-smokers, never smokers. But the regulation and all the decisions should be based on finding the balance and finding what's the overall public health effect, which includes some very low but existing uh, adverse effects to a non-smoker who initiates regular frequent cigarette use and the benefits of a smoker using the cigarette as a smoking substance. You know, I, I find it really funny with the people here that go to bat for Dr. Scott Gottlieb with the FDA commissioner. And he put out an announcement last week that said, yes, uh, these, there, there could be possibly po products on the market that are less harmful for cigarettes, but we're not going to allow these products at the harm of children being initiated to the use. So, you know, talking out of both sides of his mouth and, and once again proving to me that the, he has absolutely no, no, no reason to, to, prom to promote tobacco harm reduction because it's virtually impossible. No, it's not virtually. It is impossible to stop kids from doing everything. I mean, let's see that let, every day. Let, let, let's clarify two things. There is a political debate and there's a scientific debate. Um, if I was a politician, 
I could use a single case of a kid using a cigarettes and justify any kind of decisions. And emotionally, and um, I would say pseudo-ethically, it sounds nice. But scientifically, this statement is wrong. And it's wrong for a simple reason. You always need to determine the overall balance between the adverse and the positive effects. They will, there will never be anything with only positive effects and no adverse effects. Look at medications. All medications have some side effects. You don't ban the medications because they have side effects. You always look at the overall outcome. If it's positive for patients, you can accept some mild, minor side effects. And the same thing is happening on a public health matter such as the cigarette. It's exactly the same. Yeah. You cannot focus only on one group and ignore another population subgroup. Second of all, the base of the discussion being the addiction is also wrong because the goal and the duty of the public health community is to protect against disease and death, not to protect against a choice of someone who wants to use caffeine or nicotine or any other uh, habit that has some dependence potential. Uh, we can make recommendations, but making decisions that are harming one population subgroup and in this case, we're talking about smokers. For the benefit of not even preventing disease, but preventing dependence on something, I think it's wrong by definition when you speak scientifically and when we talk about public health. I'm not saying, of course, that e-cigarettes are absolutely harmless. I expect that there is some residual risk. Um, uh, and it's a very diverse product, and there are many different... Uh, products that uh, differ in terms of risk and um, especially the old style products, top coil atomizers, uh, silica wicks, which I don't know if you have, you probably have them in the US, uh, but it's extremely rare to find them in Europe right now because of the regulation. But um, uh, there may be some risk, but the risk is minimal and you also have to consider the risk difference when you look at the overall population effect. Right. It's not only X number of people who are smokers vape versus as the same a smaller or a larger number of people who have never smoked and are now using e-cigarettes. It's also the risk difference which uh, determines the public health outcome. I find it funny because Dr. Scott Gottlieb was pushing this drug a few years back called Assure that had killed a few people, but he was advocating for that drug because he said the overall benefit of it was a lot of people were getting healthy with it as well, too. So, you know, what if a few people died? Which in our case, you know, we don't have any deaths from electronics. But anyway, that's going to open up a whole different discussion. I really want to get into this uh, to this study. We don't have to be really, really detailed. I want to pull out the most important stuff so people can understand um, you know, the patterns of use, you know, compared to the, the last study that you did, which was in 2014, uh, not much has changed. It's pretty much what we expected to see. A few things kind of did surprise me, uh, but I do want to bring it up for people just kind of see here on the screen as well, too. Of course, this is the, the, the study patterns of flavored e-cigarette use among adult vapors in the United States. Uh, this was an internet survey. Of course, uh, this, uh, all the people that, that participated on it, this is the contact information. Uh, and it has a little introduction that you can read inside as well, too. Once this uh, is made available on, on uh, Dr. F's website, you'll be able to go, oh, to, to go I, I through think, it. I think it's a, it's a good idea because that's exactly what I was talking about right now. Mm -hmm. You should go to, uh, you just passed it, um, in the introduction section, uh, go to page three where you see the formula that determines the public health impact of, of e-cigarettes. It's page three of the PDF file okay. at the bottom. Yeah, this is the one. So this is a formula that I first published a um, uh, few months ago uh, in an overview about e-cigarettes. And that's exactly what I was talking about. This is how you determine the public health imp impact of e-cigarettes. You consider 
the harm difference, the, hazard, the difference in the hazard, that's it, basically it's hazard, not risk, the hazard of the product and how it differs from smoking, multiplied by the people who quit smoking with e cigarettes. And that's the benefit. And then you have the adverse effects, which is the absolute risk of the e cigarette multiplied by the number of never smokers who are using the product. Mm -hmm. And the hazard of smoking for people, and that's the getaway to smoking effect, if it exists, I don't think it exists. Right. The hazard of smoking for people who have never smoked in the past, they start with any cigarette and then they transition to tobacco cigarettes. So this, this is the formula basically that we should be looking at for the overall impact that electronic cigarettes can have for the yes. 400,000 yes. plus Americans yes. that die every year from smoking. There are some more global. details that should be mentioned, but it, it would make the formula a bit more complicated. So that's a simplified way of how you determine the public health impact. And right now, the positive side, which is the first part, by far outweighs the negative side. Right. Everywhere in the world. I've never seen a country where the negative side uh, is higher, the adverse effects are much stronger than the positive effects. And I'm talking about both countries and regions where e-cigarettes are regulated, and, but even countries where there is no regulation at all. For example, the US until recently, and still it's not finalized, or uh, some countries in Asia. We've never seen any country where the negative aspects of the cigarettes have prevailed over the positive effects. So let's move ahead to. Uh, I, I, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna keep scrolling down and just tell me when you want to stop, uh, Doctor F. As we're going going along. I mean, the methodology is something that we should be discussing. Yeah, um, the important thing in the methodology is that we used FDA compliance software. Um, which uh, makes it um, absolute clear that once the survey is online, we cannot change anything on the survey. We cannot add questions. We cannot remove questions. We cannot change the format of the question. We cannot add or remove responses. And that's why we needed that software, so that the FDA will be uh, ensured that we couldn't manipulate the survey at any point after the survey was released online. And uh, the second important thing is that um, participants were people who have ever used any cigarette irrespective of their smoking status. So we only ask people if they have used any cigarette. Once they responded yes, and then a separate question that they were adults, and the third question that they were residents of the US, once they replied positively in all these three questions, then they were um, um, forwarded to the uh, questionnaire itself. I think and, uh, we used the IP address to remove double entries, as I said. So we have 69,233 unique IP addresses as participants in this time. I think it's very, very important to once again reiterate that the software here used, and I know there were some complaints about the software and all that. There's nothing really that we can do about that. But the software here was very, very important for this particular survey in order for it to be accepted by the FDA. Okay, I want to yes. stress that. So if you're going to be using this this PDF after Dr. F puts it up, if you're going to be using it locally, if you're going to be using it for a state, I think it's very, very important for you to do note that the software here used is a software that is accepted by the FDA, and it is something that is completely valid, so people do not accuse you of manipulating the, the results. Yeah, let me clarify that even if we used another um, um, survey uh, website like SurveyMonkey, which we have used in the past, still the FDA should have to... Uh, would have to consider the data, but there would be a limitation. So basically, we removed one of the limitations, which is we didn't use, we, which is not using an FDA compliant software, and we removed that limitation. We eliminated that by using an FDA compliant software. So that was an additional strong point of the study. So moving ahead, after all the double entries were uh, were removed, we had almost 70,000, 69,233 yeah. adult e-cigarette users 
All of these are U.S. residents, okay? I think that's very, very important. Again, once again, this was to be submitted to the FDA for the comment period, okay? It wasn't that we were excluding globally. Maybe in the future we will do a global uh, uh, survey on flavors, but this was specifically for the United States. This shows you the participation, uh, uh, you know. Residence residence state, and there were only 0.7% who did not report their uh, residence state. So 99.3% reported their residence state in the U.S. Right, so you can actually Uh, take this uh, even for your state. uh, The reason why I bring this up is, you know, for example, you know, one of the states right now that's getting killed is California. You can see here California had a high participation rate of 6.4. Some other states are about 5, 4.5, I think it was Tennessee. So you can take this to your state to show that... 4,000 participants, you know, there's no other study... Um, uh, evaluating 4,000 uh, Californians and their views or their patterns of use of uh, flavors in e-cigarettes. So it can create unique uh, sub-studies and data sets coming from these four specific states, yes. Yeah. So here are some more demographics, you know, mostly male on the study, which kind of expected on online stuff, marital status, employment status, education, uh, income, uh, degree yeah, programs these, and stuff these like are that. standard demographic data that we always ask. We ensured that um, we didn't ask for any information that would identify the participant. The, the participation was completely anonymous. But these are the standard de- demographics that uh, are asked in any uh, anonymous study. All right, <coughs> moving, moving ahead. Uh, I think this is very, very, very important, uh, Dr. F, and I do want you to kind of expand on it as well, too. The smoking history of participants which is presented in table uh, A3, uh, excuse me, table three. Talk to us about the results there. Yes, you can uh, go a bit down and look and show table three, where uh, you see that the vast majority of the participants were uh, smokers, have ever smoked, and eight out of ten were established smokers, so they have smoked more than 100 cigarettes in their lives. That's the FDA definitions, and that's why, you know, they may look strange, but that's how the FDA um, defines an established smoker. Um, some were current smokers, so we considered any past 30 day smoking as a current smoker. Although you see that some people have smoked in the past 30 days, so the 13.4% said that we have smoked in the past 30 days, but 3.3% of them don't smoke now at all. So they are probably recent quitters, let's call them. But um, um, Adhering to the FDA um, uh, definitions, we considered even these people who don't smoke now, but have smoked in the past 30 days, we consider them as current smokers. So out of all participants, uh, basically 87% uh, do not smoke and uh, 13% uh, still smoke tobacco cigarettes. Which, by the way, is uh, 80% better than the current available NRT methods that are uh, approved by the FDA, just to put that out there. And I yeah, did, but, I, I did yeah, get a. Don't, don't forget. Let's let's be let's let's make it clear. That's not a, a measure of the smoking cessation efficacy of e-cigarettes because this is a convenient sample. These are people who were asked to participate. It was not a random sure. sample in the population, so yeah. you cannot um, um, get any data about the efficacy of of uh, uh, e-cigarettes in smoking cessation, but. What is important is that most of these people, and we will see that in the next uh, table, uh, were frequent, mainly daily cigarette users. That's very different from the current definition of a current cigarette user who is uh, in the US. Uh, anyone who has used even one puff of any cigarette in the past 30 days. And I think it's a big problem with this definition because it largely overestimates cigarette use. People who are using e-cigarettes for recreational or whatever other reasons, very occasionally, once a week, uh, once every two weeks, uh, on a weekend, these people are considered current e-cigarette users, but they are not regular frequent users. They are occasional users who may be using the e-cigarette continuously, but not every day. Uh, maybe every week, maybe every two weeks. Uh, the big difference is that this sample, uh, in this sample, 
most of the cigarettes were using the e-cigarettes daily. So if you look at table four, for example, you will see that 93.5% are using e-cigarettes every day. Uh, table four, uh, a bit down more, uh, yeah. Uh, so you see uh, now use e-cigarettes and you see that the every day is 93.5 percent so it's a, a it's a big difference in the uh, uh, in the characteristics of this population compared to what in the u.s is considered the current e-cigarette user where in most cases most of these people are not daily cigarette users so when you look at uh, current cigarette use and you see a percentage, you should uh, remember that this is not daily or frequent cigarette use. It includes a lot of people who are very occasionally using cigarettes. Yeah. So that's a difference in the, in the characteristics of the population uh, compared to what you see in, in other surveys or studies. Also, I do want to mention that I did catch a lot of flack for some of these questions, but you can see as Dr. F is explaining one more time that a lot of these questions are worded that way because this is what the FDA defines an ex-smoker or a current smoker or a dual user, right? So some of the vapors were pissed off about it, but you're going to have to understand and learn moving forward because we will be doing more surveys like this in the future that when you see surveys like that, the questions are designed in a way that they can be transcribed to a scientific manner that our regulators can understand, correct? Uh, to, be, to be honest, I don't, uh, I don't agree with the format of all questions, but we had to use that because that's what the FDA is um, considering as appropriate. Even the classification of the flavorings, which is very complex in my opinion, and it creates some problems, <coughs> even that, sorry, uh, came from uh, FDA data. So we had to add here, and that because the FDA is going to be the recipient of this study and this data, and of course we're going to publish it in a scientific journal, but because of that we wanted to add here to what the FDA is expecting and what the FDA accepts. Uh, so um, some of the format, yeah, I also find it quite problematic. But since that's the established way of asking specific questions, we, had, we thought it would be better to uh, ask the questions in an established way rather than create our own um, questions and our own format which might look strange to the FDA but might look much more familiar to uh, a vapor and to us who are closer to vapors. But um, unfortunately that's the problem and we need to add here to that and uh, over time we need to explain if there is a problem with some of the formats and if something needs to be changed but for now you know, we didn't have a, uh, enough time and we wanted to do it as rapidly as possible with as many participants as possible. And so we thought that uh, we should use uh, the FDA format for everything. I really like uh, this, this next uh, section where it says the reason uh, for initiating e-cigarette use. And you're going to see it in most of the, most of the, the, the high numbers that we're going to see here. Um, you know, to help me quit smoking, 89%. Uh, because I think that they're less harmful, 83.6%. Uh, uh, E-cigarettes might be less harmful to me than smoking, for the people around me, or for me. Uh, I, I find it interesting to save money compared to smoking as well, too, was one of the high responses. Anything that you want to add here, Dr. F? Yes, uh, that was a, a question where you could uh, choose more than Multiple. one responses. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, we should also have, um, um, have included the importance for its response, but that would make it more complex, more difficult for people to participate. And we thought that that would prevent a lot of people from understanding how they should respond to this question. So imagine that for every option, you would have an option to say from very important to not important at all in a, what we call a Likert scale, five different responses, but five responses for every option. And you understand the question would have been very complicated. It would need a lot of time to provide a response for every option. And there are many options there, as you can see. So we thought it would be better to just ask them to choose what they feel uh, was applicable to them. And uh, for example, the save money, I fully believe that um, financial reasons is a very good motivation for a smoker to switch to e-cigarettes. And it should remain like that. I'm um, fully against the um, 
uh, attempts to tax the products and to make them more expensive because by definition, because it's a technology product, it's more expensive to manufacture than tobacco cigarettes. And if you add taxation, you just make it even more uh, expensive. But um, saving money, you know, might be for some people a very important parameter, but for some others, it might be a very uh, a less important parameter. Um, so there are many people who said save money, but uh, when you compare the importance of this factor to the importance of helping me to quit smoking or to improve my uh, health, maybe we would see some differences. But as I said, we didn't want to make the, the question uh, too complicated. And by the way, just a, just a programming note, in about 30 minutes, I will open the phone lines uh, to if you have any questions. I just want to get, get through this PDF quickly. And then we will take some questions for you uh, for for Dr. F uh, as well. All right, another really interesting stat that I that I found here, especially with the accusations that we're getting, the advertising for e-cigarettes was appealing to me seven and a half percent. I mean, very very low number, Dr. F. And this is something that unfortunately, uh, Tobacco Free Kids and Heart Association and the FDA are using a lot in their mainstream media push that we're seeing in the last two months, especially with Juul and some of the other products that, oh, the advertising is very, very appealing for electronic cigarettes. I'll tell you what's the problem uh, with the studies that show that advertising is, is associated with uh, e-cigarette use. The problem is that uh, here, as you see, we are asking reasons for initiating e-cigarette use. And that's very important. Why? Uh, it implies that I saw an advertisement before initiating e-cigarettes, and that's why, through this advertisement, it you know generated uh, some interest, and that's how I initiated cigarette cigarette use. Now, the population studies that are trying to uh, they are asking people: Have you seen advertisements of e-cigarettes? Yes, frequently or less frequently, and do you vape? Yes or no? And they find an association that the more advertisements that you uh, uh, have seen the more likely you are to vape. Yeah, but if you are looking at advertisements as an established cigarette user, and that's very expected, you know, once you start using any cigarettes, you want to see promotional material because you want to try different things, you want to find something better and so on. Now, these studies don't differentiate between advertising as a reason for initiation or advertising... I mean, being exposed to advertisements because I am an e-cigarette user already. And I want to see advertisements of e-cigarettes because I'm using the product already. And that creates a lot of misconceptions. Well, people know, and the authors and the researchers understand this problem. Many people who are not experts don't understand. Many experts avoid mentioning this problem. But that's a major limitation. Uh, when they find an association between seeing advertisements or being exposed to marketing material and use of e-cigarettes, they don't differentiate between seeing this material as a non-user and this making the e-cigarette attractive, or seeing the advertisements and the marketing material as an established user because I use the product, I'm interested in knowing new things and new products coming out, so I'm looking at advertisements. Uh, this failure to differentiate between the two is creating a big problem. You don't really see the impact of the advertisements uh, on e-cigarette use initiation through these studies. Uh, moving ahead, uh, this is uh, a table five where it kind of shows you the initiation product that was used, correct, uh, Dr. F? Yes. So what we're seeing here, the ma majority of the people started with, you know, either, and again, this is the difference. I, I want people to understand versus what we saw in 2014 versus what we're seeing now in 2018. The advancement of hardware, the advancement of tanks, the advancement of liquids have kind of shifted a little bit what people start off with versus what they started back in 2014. Right, Dr. F? Yes, but of course, uh, this included, uh, this survey included people who have initiated cigarette use uh, a long time ago. So, and that's why you see, for example, uh, rechargeable cigar lights, 17.5%. I think today, uh, this proportion, I don't know about the US, but in Europe, it's going to be minimal, minimal. Yes. Even ego style is going to be minimal. But um, you should consider that this survey included people who initiated cigarette use four or five or six years ago. Uh, and that's why you see some numbers which look 
quite high. For example, ego style mods, 32 percent. Uh, ego style atomizer. Also, that's quite high. Also, keep in mind, but it's not people who started using this cigarette today. You know, it's people right. who have been initiating cigarette use several right. years ago. Also, also, we did uh, push this a lot to the vape shops. So we had people that were going at vape shops. I, I mean, in my state, I did. I know a lot of the shops did it here. So a lot of the customers that came into the vape shop to start usually are not going to start with a pre-filled cartomizer. Usually, in a vape shop, they're going to get a little bit more education and better equipment to start off yes. with as well, too. Yes. So yes, usually vape shops, and I, I have this experience here in Europe. Uh, right now, there are third generation starter kits. Third generation, I mean variable wattage devices, basically, and tank atomizers as starter kits, and that's what people are using. Uh, nicotine initiation. This was a little bit surprising to me. I mean, we do see the 18 to 24, which is generally what what we uh, recommend for people to start off with. But we're seeing a, a high number at one through six milligrams as well, too. And, you know, I mean, the sub ohm culture and some of the higher power devices are what's kind of shifted that. Right. Right, Dr. Yes. Yes. And the fact that basically, even if you want to, you cannot vape more than six milligrams per milliliter from a um, uh, sub ohm direct lung inhalation device. It's impossible. It is uh, very irritating. Uh, on the throat, very irritating on the lungs, you have immediate cough and it's quite um, heavy. So basically, these people probably represent uh, people who start with um, direct lung inhalation pattern and they cannot use anything more. Or people who uh, were given wrong advice. Correct. Because a smoker with a mouth to lung device cannot quit with one to six milligrams, even with today's devices. If, if you, if, strong, yeah. but not that strong. if you add up though, 12 milligram and 18 milligram, which is basically the, what, what we're, what we're seeing to be the, the correct number, we're still up at that, you know, 43, 44% as well too, which is kind of expected. Yeah. Uh, how difficult was it to find a flavor that you like? Uh, we see here that it was uh, kind of easy, and a lot of these people have gone to the vape shop. It was you know, easier for them to find um, and try flavors at a vape shop than trying to order online like we used to do back in 2010 and 2011 when we started. Um, we get into the flavors now, right? We're getting into the initiation stage of the flavors, and I want you to expand yeah. a little bit on this, Dr. If This is the flavor that you used when you started or attempted to try an electronic cigarette? Yeah, uh, we had three, three separate um, sections in the questionnaire. One addressing the e-cigarette patterns of use at the initiation of e-cigarettes. Another one, the current use. And the third one for people who have quit smoking with e-cigarettes. Uh, what was the patterns of use at the period of quitting, when quitting? Uh, because, you know, it may be different. The, the initial choice may be different. The choice when you quit could be different, and the today's choice may may also be different. So um, uh, that's why we had three separate sections. Basically, they were the same questions, but addressing different time points. Uh, so this table now is addressing the e-cigarette initiation period. So when you first started using the e-cigarette, so the questions were addressing the first time you were using the e-cigarette. What kind of device did you choose? What kind of flavors? The nicotine concentration, again, as you said, it was during the initiation stage. So I think that everything is important because the initiation stage, and especially the quitting smoking period, uh, is showing what works for smokers. Uh, but the current uh, use, uh, especially among people who have quit smoking, shows what's good for people who have not relapsed back to smoke. Who stayed off cigarettes. Yes, who have maintained their smoke-free status. They, they are established former smokers and they haven't gone back to smoking. So, so I think that's also important because we have seen in the past the transition in flavor choice and flavors use. It was obvious in my study, which was published in late 2013. Um, and there is also in this study transition. The only thing is that we see that a very small minority, one out of five, initiate with tobacco. Yes. And probably that's, um, um, uh, that's a characteristic of, of the U.S. population. Uh, of course, there's a transition over the years, also in, the U, in, the, in Europe. The availability of non-tobacco flavors has increased substantially. 
and uh, also the flavors are becoming much more complex. So, um, as I said before, that was a flavors classification that the FDA is using. But I understand that, especially today, there is a big problem with this classification. There are many flavors which are very complex. I would say most of them are very complex and include a blend of fruit, sweet, and desert flavors. So it creates something which is unique. Premium but, gourmet. Yeah, but you know, no one knows exactly what it is. Is right. it a fruit flavor or is it a sweet flavor or is it a desert flavor? And yeah. you know, even the same flavor, if you ask two or three different vapors, they will give a different classification. Correct. But that's something that currently is very difficult to be addressed through a question um, because, you know, we don't really have characteristic flavors as in the past where we knew that, you know, you had a watermelon flavor, it was mainly watermelon. Right. You had a caramel flavor, it was caramel. Now caramel is used in 10 different flavors. Right. In right. fruit flavors, in sweet flavors, in desert flavors, in anything. Tobacco in flavors, flavors, yeah. Yeah, even in tobacco flavors, yeah. So it makes this classification very problematic. I understand that some vapors may be thinking, okay, I know what I'm using, but I can't find the classification that perfectly fits to the flavor that I'm using. Right. I understand that we may have different classifications for the same exact product. For some of them, it would be a tobacco or a fruit flavor. For others, it would be a sweet flavor. But again, that was the uh, FDA definition, and there is nothing we can do about it. Yeah, and I just kind of went with it when I took the survey. I mean, I vape uh, all day like a eucalyptus menthol mojito type. So I just went fruit and menthol. You know, it's just just kind of generalized on it. I, I know a lot of people, again, had issue with it, but... You know, it is what it is. I understand why you did it, and, and it was pretty simple to navigate. You know, moving from this, you know, we're going to see, I mean, one thing that we can take away from this, Dr. F, no matter what people say, is that flavors are the most important part of vaping. I mean, there's just no doubt in my mind that even even seeing this, and I always compare it to the 2014 survey because that's what we have to go by. I'm seeing huge amounts of fruit bakery you know flavored liquids versus the tobaccos more tobaccos and as vape shops here have progressed obviously they offer 90 percent 95 percent flavored product in, the, in their stores now and very very small amount of tobacco and with a sub ohm culture and the bigger tanks it's easier to pick up a flavor that's very very intense in a sub ohm setup than it is to put a tobacco flavor and I, I think that's one of the reasons why we see the numbers that they are but that does not change the fact that flavors, I mean, there's just no denying for people that initiated uh, e-cigarettes and have maintained to stay away from combustible tobaccos, flavors is the most important factor. Yeah, and uh, if, if you um, uh, show again the, the table, you will see that we have two different questions which look alike, but they're not at all uh, similar. Um, one a, a bit above, uh, to show the, the, the question on top, flavor choices, so it's plural, used regularly at the cigarette use initiation and that means that means that we ask them to choose as many options as were applicable to them Correct. so they could choose more than one option the next question is talking about the most often single flavor used so i think that's even more characteristic correct and shows that again tobacco flavors were uh, even more uh, even less frequently used than, um, uh, you know, in the previous question. Correct. When you look at the single most important flavor that you considered when you initiated the cigarette use, so they had uh, the option to choose only one type of flavor and not multiple flavors. Um, we know that when someone visits a vape shop, usually they take, they buy many different flavors to choose, to try and to find what they prefer. So the second question was mainly their preference. If you had one only to choose, what would be the one you were most often uh, using? And, and that pattern fits with me as well, too. When I started, I, I vaped a sour apple, decaying sour apple from China all the time. But I did have a tobacco flavor for the morning or if I had a cup of coffee to use. You know, I'd screw up a cardamizer with a tobacco flavor if I needed that. But the majority of the time, I used a sour apple. That's what really you know, got my taste buds to change from, from a combustible tobacco. All right, let's move ahead. Yeah, to be honest, I was a bit surprised because um, uh, in my previous study in Europe, um, not only in Europe, it was also, no, it was in Europe. In my previous study, we had uh, the majority were using tobacco flavors at this age. 
And that's also my impression today, at least in Greece, seeing uh, vapors and uh, interacting with vapors, they all start, most start with tobacco flavors. There seems to be a different trend in the US. I'm not sure if it's because the smokers are different or it's because they get this advice from the vape shops. I think it's um, not a good advice to start with non-tobacco flavors. Um, it feels strange for a, for, a, for a smoker. I'm not saying that they shouldn't try something else, but I'm saying that they should definitely buy a tobacco flavor too, uh, because it, it's the best thing uh, resembling smoking, although it doesn't resemble at all. They are much sweeter and they don't have this burning taste. Uh, but it's in agreement with another study that was published recently by Chris Russell and was done, I think, two years ago. Uh, the study was published um, a couple of months ago, but the survey was performed one and a half or two years ago. And um, it was, again, in the U.S. population. I think it was something like 23,000 participants. And similar trends were observed. So it seems like it's a U.S. trend. And the most likely, I think, it's the vape shops which are um, recommending non-tobacco flavors to the consumers. I, I agree with that. And I think that the subum culture has a lot to do with that. All right, let's move ahead. We've got a lot of stuff to cover here. Table 6, of course, is... Uh, this is uh, people that have quit smoking that are continuing it's now. to. It's right. now. It's now. It's like I... everyone, right. not only quitters. Right. It's everyone. What What are they using now? And when we say now, we mean at the time that you participate to the survey. Right. And of course, you see this transition today of the variable wattage devices, uh, which by far dominate anything else. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, absolutely. We see that the equipment here has changed mostly to advanced personal vaporizers. We've seen that the nicotine is between one and six, overwhelmingly to be the, the, the biggest choice. And then the flavor yeah. choices, of course, here, fruit leading uh, dessert second. I mean, very, very high numbers, very, very low tobacco numbers here and menthol. And again, you know, like we said, the, these characteristics, um, the characterization of flavors might not be completely to what you're actually vaping, but we can get a general idea between 46, 70 and 83 percent that the majority of people are using flavored, uh, flavored uh, e-liquid. Single most uh, uh, flavor used now, fruit, of course, 49 percent, dessert pastry, 35 percent, the two top leading in that category as well, too. Yeah. Um, this I want to bring it up here. Uh, frequency of using different flavors. This is something that we don't talk about enough, and unfortunately, the FDA is not making any mention of it, Doctor F, which really, really upsets me because I think that they they're in this. They don't. Although we had this question, a similar question, uh, in the 2013 study, uh, knowing that vapors change flavors uh, very frequently. Many of them, most of them, not everyone, of yes. course. I, I know vapors who are using the same one liquid for four years. I have a cousin who is using a single tobacco flavor from the initiation until today for over three and a half years. He hasn't tried, I mean, he tried several others, but nothing fitted to his preference. So he's using only one flavor, one tobacco flavor, a single product over these years, but the vast majority are using different flavors. They experiment and they change flavors, but they also change flavors throughout the day. And it's something that I'm experiencing myself. Every time I refill my atomizer, I need to refill it with a different liquid because I get this olfactory uh, and um, uh, gustatory tolerance. I feel that the, that the liquid is becoming flavorless. I, do I cannot perceive uh, this. Uh, it's called olfactory fatigue, basically. Uh, scientifically, and it's a scientifically um, established phenomenon. Um, it means that um, the um, olfactory receptors get saturated and you start not feeling the flavor. So you need to change uh, the stimulus. So when you change to a different flavor, once you go back to the previous one, you feel it again uh, uh, like before. So, um, and that's one of the reasons why people need to change flavors. And as you can see, many people change flavors very, very frequently. Yes, the, the, these, these statistics are, are very, very important. It's, I think it's something that we need to bring out. And I think this, again, reiterates what I'm saying is that the importance of the vape shop to be still around, to be able to offer all these flavors for the vapors to continue to stay off cigarettes. If you need to have a different flavor, you've got to be able and, to go to that and, vape shop and, and taste it. that plays a big role because if the FDA sees that many people use tobacco, but many also use other flavors, they shouldn't think that, okay, these people are also using tobacco, so they would be fine with tobacco. No, these people need to change flavors. The olfactory 
uh, fatigue phenomenon, which I mentioned in 2013, has never been mentioned again since then. And most of the scientists and the regulators don't know about it, that this is a phenomenon present in e-cigarettes, and it's not present in tobacco cigarette smoke, when you smoke tobacco cigarettes. So um, it's something that is very important. It doesn't even matter if these people are using tobacco flavors. The fact that they are changing flavors frequently means that they need something else to keep the acuity and the sensitivity of their senses. Otherwise, they feel they're using a flavorless liquid. That's something very important. Down here, I think we're, this is pretty much a recap of what we talked about. You've created graphs uh, color-coded for current smokers, former smokers, and never smokers, yes. correct? That's now uh, we, we divided the sample into three groups based on their smoking status. So current smokers, people who continue to smoke now, former smokers, and people who have never smoked, which were the minority. And all these figures, figure three, uh, figure four, all these are kind of just breaking down everything that we talked about you know, before. And, uh, yes, you know, because and we wanted to show them that even for people who have quit smoking, uh, the uh, popularity of fruit and desert pastry flavors are basically the same as people who continue to smoke, but also people who never smoke. So you shouldn't use the argument that, oh, uh, fruit flavors are um, appealing to people who have never smoked a cigarette. No, it is also equally appealing to people who have quit smoking. And that's the important message that we want to give. Yeah, you may be thinking that these flavors are attractive to never smokers, but these flavors are equally attractive to current smokers and to former smokers too. And that's so, so any restriction or ban on these flavorings is going to have adverse effects on people who have managed to quit smoking with the use of e-cigarettes. Uh, That's let, the message we wanted to convey. Yes. So let's, let's get to, the, uh, to table seven and explain a little bit the patterns. Yeah, this is uh, specifically for former smokers. Okay. We wanted to show specifically what's happening with former smokers because these are the people who get the most benefit from e-cigarette use. They get the benefit of the e-cigarette mm -hmm. use. Mm -hmm. They have managed to quit smoking because of e-cigarettes. Yeah. So uh, and that is so that is the third part of the survey, mm -hmm. which was the patterns of use by former smokers at the time that they had quit smoking. So. That's not the whole sample of former smokers. These are former smokers who said, we asked the question, if at the time they quit smoking, they were, if they were using e-cigarettes. And people who said yes, because there may be a former smoker who quit you know, before using e-cigarettes and has used e-cigarettes to prevent relapse or to start using something which is safer than smoking. But, we asked people who were using an e-cigarette at the time they quit smoking. And more than 51,000 participants said that, yes, we were using an e-cigarette at the time we quit smoking. And this is a, a sub-analysis for this sample alone. If you had never started using e-cigarettes, would you still be smoking today? Again, this is a, a very, very telling number right here. Definitely, yes, 72%, probably yes. I mean, this is... This is almost 95% yeah. of, the, of the participants in the survey. This is 95% of the former smokers of the survey, of mm -hmm. the 51,000, mm -hmm. who were former smokers who were using e cigarette at the time they quit smoking. Um, so all these numbers add to 51,000 part participants, Correct. not to 69, yeah? Correct. Just to clarify. Yes. Um, so, yeah, uh, as I said, this is the subgroup with the most benefit. So we need to see what's their pattern of use and what kind of damage could happen to these people if we uh, make any regulatory decisions which are restricting choice. Um, and that's why we made a specific analysis for this uh, subgroup. And yes, it shows that there are people, I don't know how much that percentage is uh, in, a, in, a, in a representative or a random sample of the population, but in this case, we had the majority who obviously say that it would have been very difficult for me to quit smoking if a cigarette didn't exist. And that goes together with if e-cigarettes at the way that we could 
find them and with a variety of choice that we could find them at the time we use them. So um, the variety of choice and the flavors choice was particularly important. You will see below the flavor use patterns, uh, which is also very important and that's why we did the study. Um, so you see again that the vast majority were using fruit flavors at the time of quitting smoking. Now that's important. That's the third time point that we discussed initially. Mm -hmm. This is the time point of quitting smoking. So we are asking them about choices and use patterns at the time they quit smoking. Very important. And also, you know, flavor choices again, you know, how important was it to find, uh, uh, you know, liquid flavor? Very, very important. Again, yeah. very, very high number here. Uh, flavor choices again here. We're seeing a fruit dessert. This was a multiple choice question as well, too. But you can see yeah. that flavor product is w definitely overwhelmingly Absolutely. taken. Yeah. Yes. Uh, single flavor again, uh, f flavored product again, flavored e-liquid here. Uh, once again, very, very important. Um, what was very helpful for you to quit smoking completely? This is a very, very good question as well, too, because I think, once again, I think people don't realize that uh, a lot of smokers, and I've, I, you know, all from my experience, all these years helping people quit smoking, you know what they tell me, Dr. F? When they find that one flavor, it's like a ah moment, like, oh, I found this one. This was the flavor that made me quit smoking. And, yeah. and, and the variety, very, very important there as well, too. Yes as well as the last question, which was the flavor's choice, helping them to avoid relapse. That's also extremely important. And that was a multi-option question again, both of them. So you, you could choose as many options as you wanted to. And that's why the numbers don't add up to 100, but much higher. So we asked them to uh, choose everything that is applicable. So you see again, it's fruit, desert, and candy uh, by far. Uh, and avoiding relapse is very important because many people quit smoking when they use medications or anything else. The vast majority of them relapse. Yes. You should remember that. Absolutely. The available NRT methods. Uh, here, I think we, we just kind of, you're just kind of visualizing again, putting um, uh, these charts with the same information that we just saw above. Correct? Yeah. Now we, we compare uh, the choices at the initiation of a cigarette use and the current choice so in blue color is uh, and you can see uh, just under the graph um, we saw that blue color is initiation at the cigarette use initiation and the orange color is at the time of the service or current use we wanted to show to see if there are any transitions you don't see so such a big transition I mean, I mean, the, uh, the tobacco one is kind of telling here. I mean, initiation yeah. blue, you can see, down, yes. right? By tobacco far, is going by down far, by far. Yeah. And uh, figure eight is uh, uh, the choice of the one flavor, the one. So only one option in the question. The question on the table uh, was referring to choosing everything that is applicable. Here is the one most important flavor by former smokers at the time of quitting. So only for former smokers who have quit while they were using a cigarette. And what was the single important flavor? Yeah, and this actually matches me as well. It was fruit, it really, it, it really was. Uh, all right, and, and, and further down, I, I guess a little bit of conclusion, uh, if, you, yeah. if you will speak. Discussion and about uh, what's happening with vapors, what's happening with vapors who quit smoking with the who have quit smoking with the help of e-cigarettes and how uh, a, a regulation may uh, adversely affect all these people. I think it's very, very important when you look at these stats to understand why the FDA wants to ban flavors because they are so important and they're helping this product grow and taken away from the available pharmaceutical methods that they recommend or they get paid for and the big tobacco companies that sell the alternative products as well too it's clear cut the only reason why governments states cities um uh, counties want to buy ban flavors uh dr F. they're the most important factor in vaping as I said, I fully understand the concerns about use of e-cigarettes by what we call unintended populations, whether it's use or never smoking adults. For never smoking adults, it's extremely rare. For youth, there are many aspects which are not really addressed uh, in all the population studies. First of all, 
we have this confusion with current and ever e-cigarette use, which creates several misconceptions because these definitions overestimate use. We showed, um, we published an analysis of the uh, National Youth Tobacco Survey, the CDC study on youth, the 2015 data set. We published it a few months ago in American Are Journal of Preventive Medicine, to hear where we showed uh, that uh, a regular, frequent use of e-cigarettes is rare among never smokers. It's only 0.3% of never smoking adolescents who are using e-cigarettes 20 or more days of the past 30 days, which is classified as frequent e-cigarette use. So even this current and even more for the ever use definition is particularly problematic. And I think we should focus on specific frequency uh, of use uh, as uh, to identify the patterns and to identify possible unintended adverse public health consequences. And then we should compare this with the benefit in the large group of smokers who are using e-cigarettes and have managed to quit smoking. Uh, not not surprised. First of all, great work, Dr. F. And, and in a very short time, because I know that you and, and yeah. Dr. Russell were under a lot of time pressure to get this thing done to make sure that we submit it to the FDA in time. And the, and the analysis was tremendous. Let me tell you that my my laptop crashed several times because it was a huge data set, and I was trying to do um, three or four uh, statistical tests at the same time, and I couldn't do it. I received the message that there is not enough memory. I have a 16 gigabyte. Uh, RAM, but still that was not large enough to to um, make all this analysis. So it was time consuming, very difficult, very difficult to create the question that would be short enough to uh, motivate people to participate, but get all this information and use this in a format that the FDA accepts. So it took a lot of intensive work for many days, 24 hours work to be able to uh, pro uh, to release it on time and get as much participation as we had. I, I do want to mention, by the way, that'll be the next fundraiser. Let's uh, let's get uh, Dr. F a, a supercomputer so he can analyze the survey. 215-383-5752. I'll have the phone lines up for a little bit if you want to call in and have some questions. I do see a couple of people are lined up already. Just to kind of recap for you, uh, this was just a brief presentation of the results. To me, not very, very surprising, honestly. And I think anybody that's a vapor or has a, you know extensive experience with a product, it won't be very, very surprising to you. It has been now uh, entered in a way that we can present it to the FDA. We can present it to states and to municipalities that are trying to ban flavors. And it is another tool in our arsenal to be able to use to fight the upcoming battle, uh, especially in 2019 that we're going to see in a lot of uh, a lot of states that are going out there. This entire PDF will be available up on Dr. F's website, which is e-cigarette-research.org. The entire PDF will be up there for you guys to download. You can print it out, save it in your arsenal when we're talking about bands. All right, 250, you're on the air with Dr. F. Hi, it's Bill Charling here. Hey, I Bill. just want to uh, give a big thanks to Dr. F for all the work he and his team did on this. I had, had a quick um, question here. Uh, now, it'd be great if we could eventually compare the same kind of results with UK to hopefully get rid of while well, UK has different kind of lungs, so their study shouldn't apply. But I don't think a lot of people realize how expensive these, uh, even a survey like this is to do. And I know you probably can't give the exact cost or anything, but can you give everyone a bit of an idea of how much it costs, which might explain why there aren't thousands and thousands of these kind of research being done? Good question, Bill. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you if you uh, if you were in a university in the U.S. and you would apply for that kind of study, uh, I think you would need at least half a million. Half a million dollars. Yeah. Now, now you know. And maybe and maybe I'm underestimating it. Explains why it's not done very often. Uh, yeah. I know a lot of people are saying, "Well, why don't we just do it?" and I, I again, I, I'll leave the calls to everyone else, but I want to thank you and your team again so much. This is valuable, even for us here in Canada. It's really valuable. Yeah, um, so I, my I thanks. I just want to clarify that uh, I'm not going to wait for the FDA to release my comment, my the data publicly. 
I will release it. I mean, right now, as we speak, I'm just writing a short commentary that I will upload, uh, upload in my blog, and I will include a link to the PDF file, the same file that I submitted to the FDA, so, so that it can be referenced by anyone. Anyone can download it, and anyone can use the link for um, in, in any kind of interaction with uh, authorities, regulators, or anyone else. I I, th I think it's a, especially I think that there's one upcoming Sacramento uh, ban coming in California for those that are going to be attending. Download this from the website. It's going to be up in a little bit for the people that are looking at the website now. Doctor F is going to do it after we get done with this with this presentation. But it will be up there. Download it, print it, and take and submit it to your to your city council members. And of course, we will publish the data in a scientific journal. Yep. Yeah? Yeah, of course, this is going to be... Now you know why Dr. Glantz goes out there and kisses ass all the time because he needs to get these millions of dollars for his University of California to be able to do these grants, you know, I mean, excuse, excuse me, to do all these, these, these BS, uh, you know, studies that he does. You need millions of dollars. Yeah. And, and we're working with a, with a, with a peanut uh, budget. 215-383-5752, just a few more minutes. If anybody has any questions for Dr. F, please call in. Uh, you know, Dr. F, we keep talking all the time about, you know, the industry and the vapors keep asking for, oh, we need to do studies on this. We need to do studies on that. Uh, you know, nobody in this industry wants to step up. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't personally believe that the vapors should be funding studies, especially when we're talking about products and liquids and, and atomizers and wires and stuff like that. Some of these manufacturers need to step up. Um. Yeah, there are many problems with the funding, and I think uh, we should start again um, some crowdfunding campaigns in the same way that we did previously to ensure, you know, um, uh, impartiality and independence, while at the same time giving the opportunity to anyone who wants to contribute to be able to do so. Um, I think that's the best way of doing things, um, uh, because I doubt that, um, uh, you know, there are many studies that we want to do and we don't have the funds to do that. And mainly I'm talking again about replication studies. Recently there was a study by the same authors who published a study about flavorings and aldehydes, which was wrong, all the data were wrong. And now I'm using the opportunity. Uh, as you know, we published a replication study fully debunking all their claims and all their data using the same exact equipment. Um, and I want to remind everyone that the authors of this study repeatedly denied to tell us what brand of liquid they were using in their study. And we were very lucky because one of the flavoring had a name that was unique, that was available only from one manufacturer. And that was Dragon's Cafe from Missy Blend. And that's how we found out about the study. We never received a confirmation by the authors. But after the study was published, and I'm talking about a few days ago, uh, I mean, the study was published a few months ago, but a few days ago, the authors had the nerves to submit a letter to the editor about our replication study, which was very aggressive and very insulting towards myself. Now, I need to tell you that the letters are usually up to 500 words in uh, size. His letter was close to 1,000 words. My response, which will be available together with his letter in a few days, was 2,700 words. Six pages completely destroying all his arguments and explaining to him that he cannot even read the studies that he's citing himself, suggesting that they agreed with his um, uh, studies. I'll give you one example. He was citing a study which found 600 times lower aldehydes than his study, and he was citing that study as if it was agreeing with his results. We're talking about a scientist who cannot even read the numbers and understand what the numbers mean in a publication. And uh, I'm sorry for being insulting, but that's not very different from what I write in my response, that he's citing, he was citing studies that completely rejected his findings. For example, he was citing a study who said that 
we couldn't find any association between aldehyde emissions and flavorings, which was the exact opposite conclusion from his own study, who said that flavorings dominate aldehyde emissions from e-cigarettes. And he was citing this study as a study that was agreeing with his comments. I mean, he was referring to studies that he probably hasn't read. And he had the nerves to submit a very aggressive and insulting letter to the editor, saying that we are underestimating aldehyde emissions by one order of magnitude, by 10 times. His uh, findings were 500 times higher than our study. And and, and, I do, and these studies are were, were being used constantly in mainstream media to to yeah, uh, to bash yeah, us. Yeah. All right, I got a couple of phone calls, Doctor F. Nine three seven, you are on the air with Doctor F. Hey, Nine. Jamie, this is Kevin. Hey, what's up? It, what's happening, man? I really just want to say thank you first to everybody that worked on this so hard. It's an astounding uh, result. Um, and the only question I've got is what's the next most important thing that Dr. F is working on? Um, and if you can add, what's the most important thing that we learned from this specific study? Okay, thanks. I appreciate, it, I appreciate it. Thanks for the, for, for the question. All right. Uh, uh, I guess let's reverse it, uh, Dr. F. First of all, what is the most important thing that we, that we took from this study? I think that we need to provide an insight on how important the flavors are for people who have managed to quit smoking for, uh, with e-cigarettes. I think this has been largely underestimated. People think that oh, it's tobacco, tobacco flavors and nothing else is needed. All the rest is just uh, having fun. It's not at all like that. And uh, this study is one step towards giving them an insight of what's exactly happening with flavors. That it's not a marketing trick to attract new users who have never smoked, to attract new people into nicotine use or into e-cigarette use. It's something that is needed by the consumers who are, in most cases, smokers and many have quit smoking. This is exactly the um, uh, conclusion that I used and I mentioned in my 2013 study. So flavorings are marketed to satisfy the demand of adult smokers. Absolutely. That's exactly the main conclusion in this study adding also to the fact that many former smokers are mostly using non-tobacco flavors when they quit smoking, uh, which is also equally important. Now, other studies, yeah. Uh, we hope that in a few weeks, we're going to publish a study which was addressing a very recent publication from uh, John Hopkins about metals in cigarettes. I'm sure you remember the media stories, toxic metals, dangers and risks for e-cigarette users. <coughs> so together with Brad Rodu, we did something very simple. We took their results, their own results. We didn't do any tests ourselves. We didn't have any money. And we were not paid for our time to, to prepare this analysis. We took their results and we analyzed the levels that they found, comparing them with the the safety limits for inhalation medications, which are available from the FDA, and believe me, there are safety limits for metals inhaled through inhalation medications, it's not zero. And uh, for those metals that we couldn't find any such data, there were two or three metals that we couldn't find data from the pharmaceuticals, we used occupational setting limits. And we found that in most cases, you need to vape something like 150 milliliters of liquid per day, up to 1 million milliliters of liquid per day, one ton of liquid, in order to exceed the safety limit. Which is virtually right. impossible. <laughs> yeah, even 150 milliliters per day is virtually impossible. Right. The only exception was nickel, which was um, 20 to 60 milliliters in order to get to the safety limit for, medica for inhalational medications. And this is something that can be very easily avoided by just uh, avoiding the use of nickel uh, um, materials in the atomizer or in the uh, coil. Yeah. Uh, don't use nickel-containing coils or, at or atomizers. So, um, I think nickel is pretty much dead now anyway. <laughs> basically, uh, we don't dispute their findings, 
But what we are showing is that their findings are extremely low, extremely low, unlike uh, their interpretation and presentation of the study, which was basically a mispresentation, uh, saying that all oh, the levels are uh, very high and very dangerous. And the problem was very simple. They were comparing uh, vaping and the concentrations they found with the concentration, the acceptable concentration in the environment. But there's a problem. The acceptable concentration in the environment means that you are exposed to this concentration with every single breath, 24 hours a day. But you take only 400, 600, 800 puffs, puffs per a day. day. Yeah. This represents 0.02% of your breathing rate. In the 24-hour period, yeah. Yeah. So you can't use the environmental safety safety limits which address continuous throughout the day exposure with uh, a product that is used so intermittently it's wrong Absolutely. and that's why we used the daily dose the daily exposure total daily exposure and we basically calculated how much liquid you should consume daily in order to exceed those safety limits. Imagine what we could do if we had millions of dollars funding these studies. 87870, you're on the air with Dr. F. Yes, Dr. Parcelina, first and foremost, thank you so much for everything that you have done and continue to do for us as an industry. You mentioned previously that, uh, that you know, the studies regarding aldehydes and heavy metals. Uh, given the release of information from the FDA on August the 3rd, do you have any intention on uh, performing a study regarding the toxicology of e-liquids as a whole? We, we, we can't do it because we don't have the money to do it. Simple. We are um, uh, unable to find funds to replicate. I mean, the guy who I mentioned previously who, ha who submitted the letter to the editor now released a study saying that uh, vapors, when they inhale, they take a puff, they then exhale high amounts of formaldehyde into the environment. Uh, I doubt that there is any uh, accuracy in these findings. We want to replicate the study using vapors and collecting their exhaled breath and measuring aldehydes, and we can't find the money for that. So the main problem is not the lack of ideas or the lack of um, uh, facilities. It's the lack of funding. Who is going to pay the lab? The lab uh, is uh, someone who needs to be paid. Uh, myself, I also need to be paid because that's my job, basically. I'm doing research 100% of the time. There's nothing else I can do. I don't have time for anything else. Uh, just before we, we started this, uh, this uh, live debate, I was writing um, a paper. Uh, and I have so many things to write uh, and so many data to analyze. Uh, it's becoming extremely difficult. You know, I'll give you an example. It took me four months to analyze the National Youth Tobacco Survey, the 2015 survey by the CDC, and publish the paper in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. I was working for four months, at least five hours per day only on that, because it's a huge data set. It has very complex statistics. You know how much I was paid for this job? Nothing. I had no funding at all. Zero. That's not sustainable on a personal level, but also we have to cover expenses. The lab, when we do the test, needs to be paid. And we don't have the money to do anything. Yeah, I, I think that's what it all boils, boils down to. I don't think people understand, and, and thanks for the question, caller, and unless there's something else that you want to add, but I think that people don't understand that to, it, it, just the hiring a lab to do analysis and to do, you know, the data set numbers and all, all that costs money. I, I don't understand how people think that we can do all these studies without having any funding. I just don't I just don't get it. I mean, the pressure should be from the consumers on the people that sell these products, whether they're liquids or hardware, is, is to provide more studies in order for us to use in our arsenal to be able to combat these bad, bad, bad studies or these 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 fear mongering mistrued and and just completely data manipulated studies that are coming out against us yeah I, I wouldn't call that data manipulation i would call that um, uh, I, I was a little bit more uh, more aggressive doctor if i'm not a doctor i can say that <laughs> it's a mispresentation misinterpretation you know i i, I don't i rarely uh, consider that they are I, I mean i don't think that they ever manipulate data 
I don't think that they are doing mistakes in the analysis, but they're just presenting the data in the wrong way. Uh, and uh, this is creating the, the issue. And of course, I think that they are also adjusting the protocols in such a way. Um, I, I think there's a lot of predisposition. Unfortunately, I mean, they found the metals. We used the same numbers, and our conclusion is very different from the conclusion in that study. We used their own numbers. And they mentioned in the, not only the paper, but also the press releases and the press statements that that's a big risk for vapors. And we analyzed the same numbers, exactly their data, and we found that there's barely any problem. So it's a matter of mispresentation and misinterpretation. It's not a matter of, you know, manipulating the data, reporting wrong numbers, changing the numbers that they found or anything like that. And it has happened repeatedly. This has happened repeatedly. It's not the first time. And it's not going to be the last time. All right. It all boils down to the same thing as, as, as always, unfortunately, in this industry. We want to do so much, but nobody is willing to step up for it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can only do uh, based on, you know, you, I, I got so many messages of like, why are you doing this for the U.S. only? Why don't you do it for Canada? Why don't you do it for Bulgaria? Why don't you do it for New Zealand? You want to do it for your country? More than happy to. I'll be more than happy to get out there and try to give you the promotion and get the people to do it. You need to find the funding. <laughs> you want to do it in Canada? For, for, find, all these, find the for all these uh, formaldehyde studies, we had uh, a, a crowdfunding campaign two or three years ago. And to raise $70,000 with which you can do nothing in the U.S., we managed to do all these studies with that money from crowdfunding campaigns. And we managed to get the money literally in the last moment with you creating a very aggressive campaign in the last few days. That was pretty for embarrassing for me. Yeah. It was embarrassing. Yeah, for $70,000, which are useless to any institute in the U.S., they can't do a single... You can't even get in the door for seventy. A, a part yeah. of one of the studies that we did. Yeah. Not even a part, a small part. I agree. Because it's expensive. And you see, we couldn't get it. We, we got it all literally in the last moment. It was your actions and the very aggressive campaign by yourself over the last uh, few days. For one month that the crowdfunding was on, we had nothing. So we, we can't proceed like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, very, it's, it's becoming extremely hard. And, and, and I do want to thank the people that, that, that have stepped up. We need to wrap this up. We've gone, we've gone far. And, and this will be posted on YouTube as well, too, for a replay for the people that, that, that want to share it out there and get the true information out there. Unfortunately, it is YouTube. So, again, one, vapors are going to watch it. But it is a good tool to use as we're moving forward with flavor bands. Uh, Dr. F, I want to thank you and Dr. Uh, Russell and everybody else that was uh, involved in trying to get this thing done. The data to me is very, very telling. I know I am going to print this out as soon as you have it ready. And in my next legislative meeting up in um, Nashville, Tennessee, when I go and I talk to uh, legislators, whether there's a ban coming, I will present it to them. That way they'll keep them educated. Don't only use it when there's a threat. Use it to educate before the threat comes. So that way when the threat does come, these politicians will remember that you presented them with, with a, a big, a, a, the biggest survey ever done of U.S. vapors and how important flavor are to keep on smoking. I do want to thank um, Kasa. I do want to thank Vape Tithing, I would, uh, Vape, Vaping Legion, all the YouTube reviewers and the influencers on Instagram that stepped up to get the word out on this study. I do not want to thank groups like Spot Eye Names that, that did not promote this at all, which is kind of ridiculous. For whatever reason, I'll talk about that on Smoke Free Radio. But once again, I want to thank you, the seven, almost 70,000 vapors that took part and took the time, the 10, 15 minutes that it took, even though some of these questions were a little bit, uh, you know, I, I understand not really matching with today's, you know, descriptions, but I do want to thank you for taking the time. It was really, really important that you participated and you go down in history as being so far the largest ever survey done on the importance of flavors in electronic cigarettes. So, Dr. F, with that, I'll give you the last words. Um, nothing. I also want to thank the participants and I want to thank everyone who um, uh, really promoted the survey. I don't want to mention anyone specific because I'm going to forget someone and yes. they might feel offended. But um, um, I think it's extremely, as, as you saw in the survey, we didn't have any product specific 
um, uh, um, um, marketing, uh, uh, indirect marketing or indirect promotion. The, the study was not addressing specific products or specific types of products. So no one should feel threatened from such a study that it is showing some trends which are uh, not favorable for any particular product or product type. Uh, and we never do product specific research. So um, I think uh, the industry should have promoted it more. I know that some parts of the industry did promote it heavily. Some others did not. I'm not uh, uh, fully aware of the specifics. Probably you know much more than I do. Uh, but I want to avoid mentioning someone for, and risking forgetting someone else. But I want to thank everyone and, of course, thank the vapors who were those who provided us with the data that we were able to share eventually to the, with the FDA. Thank you, Dr. F. And, uh, you know, I'll see you in September, right? Yeah. Sure. Looking forward to it. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Please share this video. Get that information out to the people. And until the next one, have a wonderful day.